going to be our opportunity to look ahead for the ag economy. And we're going to have an entire panel focused on this topic. But our lead speaker is Dr. Seth Meyer, the chief economist at USDA. We're so fortunate that we had not only Secretary Vilsack, but Dr. Meyer with us. And after he gets done presenting, then I'm going to call on each of our other panelists to make remarks. And then we're going to have time for questions and answers after that. So Seth might not be a stranger to many of you because he has been very involved in looking forward for American agriculture and, in fact, global agriculture. He was appointed USDA's chief economist in 2020 after having spent two years previously at the department. Prior to that, he was a research professor and associate professor for the Food and Ag Policy Research Institute at the University of Missouri. And prior to that, at FAPRI, he was the head of the World Outlook Board. He previously served as an economist with the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, the United Nations, and as a visiting scholar at several research institutions. He also hails from the great state of Iowa, where he uh, went to Iowa State for his bachelor's and master's, and later on, PhD in the University of Missouri. So please help me welcome Dr. Seth Meyer. Uh, hey, thank you very much. All right, the first thing I'll say is uh, thank you all. It's nice to be out in front of civilized company. So I appreciate get, getting out of my house. I'm living down the road in Columbia, Missouri. When I chance to go back to D.C. I went for a little bit and I, I said, I don't, I don't mind Missouri. Got plenty of uh, meat and plenty of gasoline. I'll just hang out here for a while. So I've been working remotely from Columbia, Missouri. So that's the first thing. The second thing is there was a small error in there. I've been chief economist not since 2020. I've been chief economist since 2021. So I haven't been chief economist at USDA all that long. I'm going to give you a really quick market overview and the reason I'm going to give you a quick market overview is because we got some really great panelists who know more than I do so they can jump in and give you all the details all right you all gonna put this monitor so I can so I can see the uh, slides or do I need to look over my shoulder oh, I can look over my shoulder that's fine you'll, you'll see me wandering around anyway so I'll start out here with, you know we have these discussions, and somebody asked me, are we in a boom? The, the, some somebody on, on USDA radio, are we in a boom? And I remind folks where we were at a little over a year ago and what folks' sentiment was in the market a little over a year ago. I show this in all my presentations. Remember where we, are, we were prior to August of 2020. Okay, so this in my mind is an important context here. We've seen a big run on commodities since August 2020. So what I have here is, is uh, November and December futures here for corn, beans, and hogs. And look, and the line there represents August, right? So that's where we've been. Uh, we've had a lot of gain since then. I think it's hard for us to remember where we were, say, June of 2020. All right, maybe not for some of you, but remember that. And, and I put the, the, this is a somewhat confusing chart here, but I put these arrows in here to remind you also of what happened during that period. Okay, so I've broken it out into a couple of periods to show you since August 2020, our idea of how big the crops were started to shrink, and at the same time, you know, normally you think, okay, uh, size of the crop is shrinking, we need to start rationing demand. So demand should be moving down. But look at what trade demand was doing at the same time we were shrinking those crops. Trade demand was increasing in volume as those crops were getting smaller. So that is obviously a very big feature about where we're at. And, and, and to put that trade in context, you know, when we first started uh, uh, this discussion, when we first were entering issues of COVID, it was very much, what is COVID going to look like? What is COVID's impacts on the ag sector going to be? And, you know, part of the initial reaction was we're going to have an economic slowdown, a contraction in trade, and this is going to be a bad for agriculture. It's going to be like the Great Recession there, which is your big dip there in trade. Hasn't been that way. As a matter of fact, demand, again, trade demand, has been incredibly robust. And as a matter of fact, trade has become record large. So our anticipated 
value of U.S. agricultural trade record large in 2021 and expected to grow a little bit from there, setting a new record. Okay. So agricultural trade, as we heard in the, that video that just played, absolutely important for where we're at today. And part of this is on the back of a big rebound in China, right? A big rebound in, in, in the volume of trade with China. They got as low as number five, back to number one strong. So this is obviously an important factor in terms of our trade demand. Now let's jump forward a little bit and say, okay, that's where we were kind of, the, the, the theme of things coming out from August of 2020, where are we at? We're clearly, we're having a Western drought. You heard the secretary talk about that. You can see it impact certain crops, certain acreage, certain livestock groups. It is an important factor to some extent in what we're observing on, in some commodities, okay? And I think the other part of this story, I talked to you about it very strong, very strong trade demand, but overall global demand being very strong as well too. Why do we have rising prices? Because both in the U.S. and abroad, carryout stocks are tightening. We've got a tightening stock situation, and you can see here. Hey, we've been bouncing around with consumption or production of both corn and beans. Uh, you know, sometimes production exceeding consumption and vice versa, and always having plenty of wheat. Well, now we've got all three in a situation where consumption is expected to exceed production at this marketing year we just ended, and now we're into the new marketing year, hoping we'll get to ease that tight uh, stock situation at a global level. Okay. And the other interesting part of this is the response in area by producers this last year to very high commodity prices. Okay, so I find this to be a very interesting result in terms of how did producers respond. So what you have here on the right is principal crop planted area. And I really think about 2010 to 2014 being very high prices. Then prices come down. We had a couple of past years of prevent plant issues. That's why principal crop area was so low. This year we don't have an issue with prevent plant. And yet we still didn't see a big rebound in planted area. Some of that is western drought some of it, but that isn't enough to explain everything that's going on. So I think that this is a, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion that I think is still evolving here, but folks initially thinking we'd have much greater area than that. Okay, so let's jump in and let's talk a little bit about the major commodities, and then I want to talk a little bit about demand, and then uh, we'll pass it off to folks who can really talk about all the details. I show this because I was talking about, I've been talking about wheat. But this isn't just a wheat graph, it's also a canola graph saying, hey, we've got some supply issues, not just here in the United States when it comes to Western drought, but when it comes to wheat, also in places like Canada. So this is both a wheat and a canola graph. And when we talk about soybeans, keep that in mind as well too, about how the canola market looks in Canada. Here's the other supplies that have really, so I think early on, you know, since August 2020, we had a really good run on corn and a good run on beans. Wheat was being kind of driven or pulled along for the ride, and all of a sudden you see something like this, which starts to give wheat its own legs, which is, hey, that Russian wheat crop didn't turn out so good. And we came out and put out an estimate in August, and folks said, you're way too low, it's not that bad. Trade is kind of converging on this number of a pretty bad uh, uh, Russian wheat crop, and that's what's provided some support for that crop in recent terms. So when you look at this in terms of overall global production, I think all I'd really have you, talk to, uh, uh, have you look at here is that ending stock number where, we're, where after maybe four or five or six years of growing carryout stocks for wheat, we're tightening up the wheat market as well too on a global level. So it's not just corn and beans, it's also wheat. But there has been, in all fairness, a very big difference in the outcomes for our wheat crop between winter and spring wheat, right? The winter wheat crop, not bad in the United States, spring wheat crop almost entirely in drought. Okay, so when you look at this, again, thinking about the global, thinking about the U.S. balance for wheat as well too, tightening down U.S. wheat markets. So something that we haven't done in quite a while. And you can go through and you can see 
that you know, having to ration exports a little bit, having a challenging export environment, and prices rising and cutting the carry out stocks for wheat a little bit. Let's talk about corn and let's talk about, uh, we'll talk about corn, soybeans, and then a little on the demand side. Shaping up to be kind of a trend yield year for corn in terms of the United States, still giving you the second biggest corn crop on record. Still giving you the second biggest corn crop on record, but let's talk a little bit about demand. I think when we go back and you think about the mood and sentiment in the market in June and July last year, or May, June and July of last year, that is a driver of the negative sentiment, or one of the drivers of the negative sentiment early last summer, right? What does ethanol demand grind look like? And clearly we've been going through several years of, very, of somewhat modest growth relative to what we saw earlier, but this uh, decline in motor gasoline consumption really hitting ethanol demand hard, right? As, as folks, I had the same tank of gas in my car for three months. Okay, that's clearly a negative for gasoline demand. But on the other side of that, we've seen tremendous export demand for U.S. corn as well, too. And one of them is a focus by the Chinese on importation of corn. And it's a, it, you know, I don't want to speak definitively about the Chinese market because I think we lack a lot of understanding and insight into the Chinese market because they're not transparent. But one of the things that we do see is They've been importing a lot of corn as, when you think about corn and corn equivalents, they've gone through periods of time where they've bringing in a lot of corn and corn equivalents. By corn equivalents, I mean things you can feed like corn, so sorghum, DDGs, barley, other things. And you can see that back in 2015, they were bringing these products in at the same time they were building their internal stocks. They were building internal stocks at a very fast rate while importing a bunch of things that feed as corn. And you could see this happen and evolve where corn's coming in and that corn, the Chinese say, no, that has a GMO trait we don't like. Then DDGs start flowing in, no, those DDGs have a trait we don't like. And then you can see other things, well, okay, sorghum's non-GMO and doesn't have a tariff, and so it began to flow. And in this situation, it's both bigger in terms of corn equivalents and very corn focused, okay? They're still bringing in lots of other stuff as well too. So there is a demand, but we don't have complete transparency in terms of what their domestic stocks are. Are they building stocks? What does things look like internally? Okay, and so when you look at this, you know, when we look at uh, here, we've had an ex excellent export year last year. So we might lose some of that export market as the Ukrainian crop comes back. So some of last year's demand, maybe it eases a little bit because we've got more competition from other, from other countries. Ethanol demand, maybe a little bit of a rebound. Second largest crop, a little bit of an expansion of carry out stocks there. And when you look at prices in this, remember these are prices received by farmers. So they lag because it includes forward priced grain. The grain is priced when it's delivered. It's counted as that period in time, okay? So, Farmers may be missing out on some of that run up in prices or getting it as prices ran up, now maybe being able to capture a bit more of that. Let's talk about soybeans real quick. And uh, September soybean yield, this is a month over month change chart, but if you look at the numbers and you're familiar with the numbers, what you can see is everything north and west of Des Moines, Iowa, dry and not so great yields. Everything east of Des Moines, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, record, record yields for both corn and beans. You know, so very good conditions. So you're looking at a big contrast between east and west to some regards in terms of yield outcomes. And again, a very, you know, average yield year for soybeans. Third biggest soybean crop as well, too, on record. So we're talking about, we're talking about very good commodity prices at the same time we're having Pretty good crops, pretty respectable crops. Demand, foreign and domestic. So when you look at this, you know, the, what, what, it, what strikes me is we are running incredibly uh, tight carryout stocks. We, are, we see a lot of foreign demand for exports, but we've got an incredible domestic crush demand as well too. We have a really substantial domestic crush demand for U.S. soybeans. Let's talk about a little bit about the export demand. You know, 
I think this is another question that comes up in China as well too. The rebounding from African swine fever, their herd is rebounding in size. How does that change their rations? How does that change their ration efficiency? Demand increases, so this is the change, you know, this is the increase in demand over time has been slowing. Where are we at as they rebound from ASF? What do those rations look like? But an expectation of those really tremendous annual year-over-year -year growth in demand slowing. And when you look at that, this gets back to my point about crush is, who's going to supply the additional growth in the rest of the world? Well, at the moment, the U.S. seems to have to put all its yield growth increases into supporting the domestic market because demand is quite good, right? So we, we don't have area expansion, perhaps like the South Americans do. We have yield improvements, increasing productivity among farmers. That increase in productivity is going to satisfy domestic needs. Okay, so we will lose market share over time, but it's not because we're losing volume, it's because you know, that volume is growing and we are using our uh, oil seeds domestically. So what we have going on here is, and, I'm, and, and I want you to keep all of these things in mind in terms of policy context, and I'm happy to answer questions on policy, even though I don't have slides up here. So we've got, one of the things going on is the crush margin in the United States has been great. That's why crush demand is so strong. Here is a big part of why that crush margin looks so good. Oil as a share of the bean. You know, we're sitting up there somewhere, 45%, had approached about 50%. Obviously a very strong demand in the domestic market for soybean oil. Let's look at the balance sheet from our last month for soybean oil demand in the United States. One of the things that you'll see clearly as an increase in demand year over year, it's about a 25% increase, is biofuel demand. And I think this remains a big uncertainty and, and a lot hinges on this, but that's obviously a big driver for what we're seeing in soybean oil and soybean oil demand. Let's talk about it a little bit more in terms of, this is another aspect of what you've seen in the market in terms of vegetable oil. So the bottom, the blue line is crude, unrefined soybean oil. The red, the orange line is refined soybean oil. So we've gone from a margin on refined to unrefined of two cents to about 25 cents. So if you need refined oil, not only are you paying that run up in price, you're paying the, uh, the, the rents which were accruing to those folks who have refining capacity on the soybean oil side. Okay. And here's what's driving that. Renewable diesel production capacity is expanding rapidly. This is a little bit old. So the EIA hasn't updated this, and I think some of these plans have been pushed back because of those high soybean oil prices. But what we're seeing is a tremendous growth in renewable diesel production. And there are lots of implications from this growth in renewable diesel. First, edible oil. So if you're making a bakery product, you need an edible oil, you need it refined. These folks also need refined soybean oil, and that's why you see that rise in the margin on the refining soybean oil side. And then on top of that, these folks are competing with your traditional fame producers, your Midwestern, your existing Midwestern producers who produce soybean oil, who don't need refined oil, but also don't have the same pathways when it comes to, say, California's low carbon fuel standard. And so I think there will be a competition evolving there as well, too, which is these are being built by big petroleum companies who will put those plants, if not inside the gate of the refinery, next to the refinery, and that changes the political dynamic about their opposition to biodiesel. They'll go from being net short those credits to net long those credits. So this has lots of implications when it comes to where crush is occurring potentially and who is producing the biodiesel. Let's talk a little bit about farm income, and then I want to talk a little bit about food prices, and then we'll move on to our guests. So, Part this, so when we think about we're translating these commodity prices into farm income, farm income very strongly being driven by corn, soybeans, hogs, cattle. That's what's driving farm income, and those are also the things where we've had tremendous domestic demand and good trade demand, all the things an Iowan could love, right? Corn, soybeans, and hogs. The other point about that is we've now transitioned, we've gone through a period of very large ad hoc government payments. 
first MFP for unusual circumstances, market facilitation payments, then coronavirus food assistance payments. When we look at farm income, we're pulling those government payments down very quickly, and yet farm income is rising because we're getting more dollars from the marketplace than we're losing from those government payments. So we're transitioning out of those payments, but the dollars are coming from the market. That's a pretty good place to be. But it's not universal. When I look at this map of farm income and look at it geographically, you can see both the effects of the drought and you can see what commodities are driving prices, right? We are driving farm income. Midwest doing very, very well. Out in the West, drought, not having those commodities that lead the way. But I also want to talk to you really quick about demand. I'm not going to go through a cotton and uh, supply and demand balance sheet, but we've also experiencing some very strange demand as we've gone through COVID. And, and it is a, remains a big question about how, what's underlying this demand and how do we move forward. So cotton is one of these ones where we're gonna increase production in the United States for cotton very strongly and yet have a much higher price for it, okay? And this one surprises folks as well too, which is we had record meat consumption in 2020. You know, we've heard, we, we will have folks from LMIC talk to you about cattle markets and, and hog markets. We had record meat consumption in 2020. And we're going to have very high meat consumption in 21 and 22. So despite all these supply chain issues, we had record consumption. Folks have decided that they want to enjoy meat. So they've got less money that perhaps that they've been spending out, out eating, and they'll buy better meat at the grocery store or more meat at the grocery store. So again, we've experienced a tremendous amount of demand shifting as this has occurred, as, as COVID has occurred. Now let's talk really quickly about food CPI, because I think that this is something that non-ag folks really can, I mean, this, this is something that grabs their attention when you start talking about food price inflation. But I want to remind you, you all know this, this is a graph that basically says, hey, along the supply chain, who gets the money? And then kind of when you break it up across the supply chain, labor versus, you know, capital versus everything else. So when you look at the right, you know, when, e when USDA ERS estimates the food dollar, the farmer gets between 14 and 15 cents of that food dollar on average, right? More for meat, less for grains, but clearly when one thinks about food price inflation, there's a lot going on beyond the farm gate, okay? And when you look at the graph on the left, that starts to tell you what those things are because the blue one's labor, okay? So clearly labor, transit, other factors like that, even, I mean, you can even see transit, transportation there is only 3% in a normal year. This isn't a normal year we're going through right now in terms of cost of transportation. So this is my last chart. And this is, again, I think that this influences how lots of people view agriculture because folks notice it. You know, I joke that folks notice when, they, when gasoline goes up a nickel a gallon, they notice it, and then they still stop at Starbucks and get a $5 coffee, right? When chicken wings are expensive, People notice that, right? So this is something obviously that gets lots of people's attention. And I've been breaking it up into three periods. The first period is the blue period when we talk about when I got lots of reporter, reporters calling me saying, how can I simultaneously only be able to get one gallon of milk at the grocery store, rationed to one gallon of milk, and they're dumping milk? Or, gee, hamburger, they're only letting me have one pack. Cattle producers must be making a fortune. Right? So you have this period of in really big supply chain disruptions where you can have falling commodity prices and rising consumer prices at the same time. As we start to resolve those issues, we have strong demand, both domestic and foreign, that starts to offer that commodity support. So as we resolve these supply chain issues, food prices don't come all the way down because they're supported by commodity prices. And now we're in this period of somewhat uncertainty because I think we can all tell stories about transportation. We can all talk, talk stories about input prices that, that concern us. What do input prices look like for next year? We can talk about labor issues and labor issues, maybe not necessarily farm labor issues, meat packing, food processing, waiting people, you know, when you think about your food dollar, staff at restaurants, all of these things, again, I think is the next step of uncertainty that I don't know how and we are studying how this influences food price inflation going on. So again, uh, maybe this is my way to say, 
when I'm wrong about any of this, this is what I'll point to you all as my excuse. But these have been three periods of very strange events within the ag sector. And, um, you know, I think that we'll still have some challenges with transportation in the, in the next 12 months. And we'll see how these things resolve themselves. Commodity prices have started to flatten. Uh, and, and, and we'll see where we go there from food price inflation. But this gets attention of folks outside of ag and colors they're thinking about ag in general, in all regards. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Seth. Maybe it's just because you're doing such a great job. We thought you were at USDA a little earlier than we announced. <laughs> um, we'd really uh, like to move on with our next presenter. And But keep in mind, this is a great opportunity to ask some of the leading economists uh, that are going to be with us here today to, uh, any question you want. So please keep entering your questions into the Slido Q&A. Our next panelist is Jackson Takich, who is the chief economist at Farmer Mac. His focus includes quantitative analysis of credit, interest rate, and other market-based risks, as well as monitoring conditions of the agricultural economy, operational information systems, and statistical analysis programming. He's a Kentucky native who joined the Farmer Mac team in 2005 working in research, credit, and the underwriting departments. Jackson is going to join us virtually, so please welcome Jackson to the screens. finances. I'm going to talk about the capital markets in 21 and a lot of the healing that's happened for, for many of the reasons that Secretary Vilsack talked about and Dr. Myers talked about. Uh, uh, they flow all the way through to the farm balance sheets and some of those conditions that are out there in the farm economy. So let's jump right in. You can't talk about farm finances without first talking about interest rates. And right now, uh, farmers and, and ag producers are experiencing some of the lowest interest rates they've ever experienced in uh, since we've been measuring, really, farm uh, finances. So I've got uh, the, some, some great data from the Kansas City Fed uh, up on the screen in front of you, which you can see here. If you're talking about real estate, if you're talking about operating lines, if you're talking about machinery, equipment, whatever it is you're talking about, you've got some of the lowest interest rates that we've experienced in the sector in the uh, ag and rural economy. Those are hovering near that bottom, so we're not seeing them pick up like we maybe saw some of the other sectors. So you saw residential rates pick up in the last six months. You've seen uh, treasury rates pick up in the last few, you know, say uh, three to four months. Uh, we're seeing that consistently low across the capital stack in ag finance. Now, it's hard to see it going, you know, a whole lot lower, right? 100, 200, 300 basis points much lower. Uh, however, there is some room for compression there if you think about things like all this intense competition between lenders and borrowers out there in the farm uh, real real estate. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities, I think, to get some uh, lower interest rates across the board in the next you know six to 12 months, but it's going to be a lot smaller than some of the more dramatic de decreases we've seen over the last, say, 12 to 24 months. Now, interest rates have a direct impact on real estate, right? So the, the lower the cost of capital, the lower the cost of financing, the more people are willing to pay generally for the asset stack. And that's what we're seeing in the farm real estate numbers. This is a series that's released every year by the USDA over at NAS, great group over there at NAS. Uh, the June area survey, they come out every August and say, this is the, the total uh, US uh, ag real estate perspective. They do it state by state. And it was a great year in 21 for uh, farm real estate. So in total, it was about a 7% gain. Uh, over 2020 numbers. That's after several years of sort of steady eddy uh, uh, gains across the farm real estate landscape. And we've seen the, the biggest gains right in the heart of the Midwest. So where you guys are in Missouri, you know, you're at uh, eight and a half, 8.8% increase year over year in farm real estate. And I'm sure if you're out there in the marketplace uh, doing deals, buying land or selling land, you're probably like, eh, absolutely, it's up 8% because it has been a very active marketplace. We're also seeing a lot of gains out west. So there's some uh, you know, drought issues 
uh, at play. Some of this, these increases, I think, have to do with the land that has water is gaining very quickly in value, and land that doesn't is kind of losing value. So you're seeing a separation between the has water and doesn't have water, and policy is going to drive that difference uh, as we go forward. We're not done talking about water in the Midwest either. Maybe this year isn't a year that we talk about it a tremendous amount. It's been fairly wet across the central Midwest and, and down into the southeast, but water is going to be a factor that drives real estate in the next uh, five to 10 years. Modest gains in the Southeast, I think, you know, that could tr turn around here in the next, you know, to, uh, a, a few months to, a, to maybe a year, you could see a, some additional pressure in the Southeast as the conditions that Dr. Meyer talked about in terms of profitability and cash flow and higher cash receipts, all that kind of works its way from the Midwest down to the Southeast. But rents are also starting to tick up. So that's kind of the flip side. Uh, if you're if you're renting land, you're starting to see those costs inch up a little bit. If you're an investor, you like to see that. But if you're uh, maybe uh, the one paying the rent, you hope that moderates just a little bit. So we're starting to see a five, six, seven percent tick up in uh, rents all across the Midwest. Not so much out west or in the southeast. So it's really in the core Corn Belt area you're starting to see those rents uh, pick up. Activity remains pretty elevated. So it's a, a seasonal slowdown, but you're still seeing a lot of activity all across the Midwest when you think about those grain markets and land that's coming up for sale through auction or uh, uh, just through traditional sales. Now, uh, farm finances in general, that outlook has stabilized quite a bit. There's two metrics I like to look at, so I'll throw them up on the screen for you. The first one is capital, uh, working capital to expenses. So think of this as how much dry powder is out there in the sector uh, to cover things like expenses. The historical average, so the, the level we like to think is a, a good safe level in the sector as a whole, it's about 30 cents on the dollar. So you have 30 cents of working capital uh, for every dollar of expenses that you have going out the door. We're not quite back there yet. So, you know, we, we I'd, say, I'd say the healing has begun. Uh, we're not completely healed. So the working capital on farms is starting to pick up. We're, we're off that that low of about 22 cents on the dollar. Uh, starting to see maybe some movement northward. So we want to see a few more years of these great commodity prices starting to move that working capital, rebuild that liquidity out there in the sector. But it's nice to see a little bit of breathing room. 20 cents on the dollar, that's kind of like the low end. That's where you don't want to breach. In the 1980s, uh, we were down to you know less than 10 cents on the dollar of working capital to expenses. So we're at a, a healthy level, but I'd like to see us maybe even get a little bit higher. Uh, if you look at interest expense as a percentage of earnings, so how many cents of every dollar of farm earnings gets eaten up by interest expense, we're at a very, very healthy level. So the, the peak during the farm crisis years was about 35 cents. That's when interest rates were really high, variable rates, and earnings dropped considerably. Today, we're at something more like 10 to 12 cents. Uh, very uh, modest levels, very manageable levels. And I think our new normal is going to be right around that 13 cents to 15 cents mark. So we're going to hold that level uh, given where interest rates are and the outlook for interest rates. And that's a very good level to, to, to handle the amount of debt load that farmers in the farm economy started to generate the last couple of years. In terms of performance, you know, I say a lot of those indicators that we like to look at bankruptcy rates, delinquency rates, all of those things are trending in a very positive a number. So chapter 12 bankruptcies, for example, uh, either if you're looking at by, by percentage of farms or by uh, just number of farms going through that very difficult chapter 12 process, those are both down dramatically in 2020 and 21. A lot of that has to do with some of the, the, the excess cash that came from the government support program payments, but then also followed up by really strong commodity uh, prices this year. So both of those things helping cure some of these delinquency and uh, bankruptcy issues that were popping up in 2020. And the other thing I like to look at is delinquency rates. So using uh, farm banks and, and uh, commercial banks all across the country to estimate how many uh, loans are past due more than 90 days. And so you can break that up by county and by region. And what you see here is uh, based on the last year of data. So the second quarter, 2021, delinquency rates are down almost across the board. So a negative number means that uh, fewer people are behind on their uh, farm debt. Uh, so all across the Midwest, the Heartland, the Northern Grains, the Prairie Gateway, a lot of healing in delinquency rates. The one place there's not, and you've heard it mentioned a couple of times already today, the Basin Range where there's been drought and uh, you know cattle prices haven't fully recovered uh, from the, the, the pandemic, you still see some elevated levels of delinquencies there. But everywhere else where you've got a lot higher commodity prices and a lot of cash flow from those government support program payments in 19 and 20, you have seen that show up in lower default rates, lower delinquency rates uh, in commercial banks. 
Uh, looking forward, so it's not all about looking back. I like to also say, hey, here are the things that I'm keeping an eye on from either a farm financial perspective or a policy perspective that might influence uh, what's going on in uh, farm finances. Inflation is going to hang around, right? So we're not, uh, we got a little reprieve maybe in August, but you're seeing it start to inch up into the farm in expense uh, line items, and you, that, that may that may continue to be a downward pressure on profitability into 22. The Fed is where we're going to be learning more and more about the, what the Fed might do in, in terms of monetary policy in the coming weeks and then months. Uh, and that could have a lot of impact on what happens to farm finances and infrastructure as well. So that's going to be uh, more policy that comes out and that we know more about in the coming months that could dramatically improve or, or hinder some of these the financial healings that we're seeing on the farm. And with that, the flip side between all that great infrastructure spend is maybe some tax offsets to help pay for it. So that could influence uh, what happens to real estate values as well as what happens to profitability on the farm. And finally, all of this kind of mixes together to affect the value of the U.S. dollar, and that directly impacts uh, how much we sell overseas, our export demand, and that's going to drive uh, commodity prices. So all these things are going to work together to influence U.S. dollar, and that can have a big impact on farm finances and the financial sector for agriculture in 22. Uh, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to turn the floor back over to you, Sarah. I appreciate your all's time, and I'm going to hang out here uh, to, to hear the other panelists and then answer any questions that you may have for me. That's great, Jackson. Thank you so much. We're going to keep moving on and bring you back in for the virtual roundtable discussion. So our next speaker is Scott Geralt from the American Soybean Association, where he is their economist providing policy analysis and monitoring market conditions. Prior to joining ASA in 2020, Scott was the program leader for U.S. crop policy and analysis at the Food and Agricultural Policy Inst Research Institute, FAPRI at the University of Missouri. He holds a bachelor's and master's in ag econ from the University of Missouri. And, you know, we're always so grateful to have the FAPRI group here. Uh, we know you have a lot of alumni that show up in uh, very influential places. So uh, welcome, Scott. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's fun to be FAPRI alumni with Seth. Uh, a little over a year ago, we were working together, and we're on stage again, and um, also, I, Seth mentioned crop prices starting to run up in August of 2020. I got pretty lucky. I started at ASA in July of 2020, right before uh, soybean prices started running up, so I, I don't know how much they attribute it to me, but if they do at all, it's, it's their mistake. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started, if we can go to the first slide. Oh, it's right here. Okay, and so Seth talked a little bit about this, but I want to dive a little bit more. Um, I'm going to start a soybean sector talk without talking about China at the beginning. Um, instead, I want to talk a little bit about renewable diesel. So probably many of you have heard about biodiesel, and um, that's historically what we've uh, used soybean oil to produce for biofuels, and it's a fatty acid methyl ester. There's this new product, newer product called renewable diesel, and it's a hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbons are what um, diesel fuel is. So chemically, it, is, it meets the same standards as diesel, same ASTM standards. So you can use it as a 100% replacement, um, whereas biodiesel, you would tend to have to blend in. And so that's driving a lot of this change. So if you look at the, at the blue bar there, in 2021, we have a little over 2.2 billion gallons of biodiesel capacity. And then if you look at the renewable diesel announcements um, and, and some current capacity, we will quickly exceed that in the next few years. Um, you can see in 2022, with current announcements, we should be about the same as current biodiesel production. And in 2023, we're exceeding that. And if you look at all announcements, we're currently up to about 7 billion gallons of renewable diesel announced compared to about two and a half billion gallons of biodiesel. Um, so you can see that's several times the level. Now, with that being said, not all of this is going to happen. We're already seeing some of these uh, plants being put on pause just because the, the soybean oil prices have um, been running up so high with all these announcements. And the other thing is most of the renewable diesel is going to California to be consumed there uh, under their uh, carbon program or low, car uh, low fuel carbon standard. If you produced all of this renewable diesel and sent it to California, um, it's really more, 
they get more carbon credits than the market needs. So you would crash that market. So this is driving a lot of things. We are seeing expansion and we will continue to see expansion. It's hard to foresee seven billion gallons of expansion. And so with that, um, if you take these announcements and you map out where they are, this is what you get. So those blue dots are the current biodiesel plants and the size corresponds to the size of the plant. And you can see those are largely in the Midwest. Um, they tend to be close to the feedstock sources. Oftentimes farmers have been involved in these plants. Those orange dots are the renewable diesel plants. And, and a biodiesel plant cannot make renewable diesel. They are not interchangeable. It's, it's different technology. And what, what we're seeing is it's mostly uh, refi oil refineries uh, that are getting into renewable diesel. They can use their processes with a little bit of a, uh, adaptation to produce it. And so you're seeing it more in oil refinery areas. You're seeing it along the coast. You're seeing it in California where they're consuming it. But the other thing you'll notice is those dots are much, much larger. For instance, there's one plant in uh, Louisiana that's supposed to be coming online, 900 million gallons a year. I mean, you're talking about close to 50% of the biodiesel production in just one renewable diesel plant. So it's, it's a very, very different sector. Um, it's instead of being uh, Midwestern, uh, smaller plants, we're talking about coastal uh, large plants. And as Seth mentioned, this is changing really the value of crush. So soybeans represent about 20% of the, our soybean oil is 20% by weight about of a bushel of soybeans. And historically about 35%, a third of the value of the crushing of soybean. But now we're up to about 50% of the value and, and we're hanging around there. And again, this is being driven by the demand for soybean oil. Uh, on the flip side, we've seen meal prices weaken. Um, we're, we're about to the point where we're crushing for oil uh, in the near term. And, and this is probably gonna continue for a while until the market kind of catches up and things equilibrate a little bit. And now I'll do one slide on China. Um, you can see we have piglet prices in the orange, uh, pork prices in blue, and hog prices in gray in China. And what you'll see is before ASF 2018, 2019, you know, we're, we're um, hovering, you know, 20, 30 uh, UN per kilogram. Then ASF hit, and we saw about a doubling in pork prices and in hog prices. But you can see as they lost a lot of their herd, they, they wanted to replace uh, those animals. And so piglet prices skyrocketed to about five times that level. Um, now prices are about to where they were pre-ASF. And this data is um, from a consultancy source in China. This is not official China, China government data, but China has been cracking down on this source actually. Because um, there have been reports of some renewed ASF. Um, and it's always, as Seth pointed out, always hard to know exactly what's going on in China. Um, but the best indication that, that we have is that their herds are largely built back. And that's why we're seeing more soybean exports to China because they need the meal to feed to this herd that has been uh, rebounding. And then one last one on input prices. Uh, if you've been paying attention to fertilizer, this chart won't surprise you too much. Um, there's been quite a bit going on here. And uh, for one, in 2021, we didn't have near as much prevented plant as we had the, the past few years. That got us more acres. We have higher crop prices. Fertilizer prices tend to be highly correlated with crop prices. So that's also raising it up. And for things like DAP, we're seeing about a doubling of the price from a year ago. And there's a few other issues going on. There's higher transportation costs. Hurricane Ida has shut down some of um, the ports for bringing it in as well as some of the fertilizer plants. But there's also one other issue, um, phosphates, uh, I think the senator mentioned this morning, have a countervailing duty on, um, on phosphates from Morocco and Russia, which were the two biggest supply, uh, foreign suppliers of phosphates into the US. We've seen some other countries since then step in uh, that traditionally weren't supplying phosphates here, but they haven't been able to supply it at the same levels. So even though we have higher demand for phosphates, we have less supply. And UAN on the, for, on the nitrogen side is also facing a similar situation. Uh, we almost faced the same thing with potash with Belarus, but uh, their, their um, exporter was not listed on the sanctions that came through. 
But we're also hearing from our producers quite a bit of concern about things other than fertilizer as well, chemicals, seeds, for a lot of the same issues with COVID-19, uh, labor shortages, Hurricane Ida, uh, limiting plants in the Gulf Coast. So um, higher, we've higher, seen higher crop prices, which has been great, but there is getting to be growing concern on the input side. And I'll conclude with that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. I know when our dinner last night with some of the commodity group execs, we heard price increases from not, uh, I heard some seed price increases around 10%, but uh, we're hearing 50% and more for input price increases. So. Uh, next up is our wrap-up presenter for our panel, Caitlin McCulloch. Caitlin is the Director and Senior Agricultural Econo Economist at the Livestock Marketing Information Center. LMIC is a national multi-state cooperative center of excellence between USDA agencies, land-grant universities, and industry associates. Her expertise includes cattle, hog, dairy, hay, and grain sectors. Prior to joining LMIC, she had stints with the Farm Credit System in Washington, D.C., and the American Farm Bureau Federation. She has a master's in ag economics from Colorado State University and a bachelor of science from the University of Maine. So welcome, Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, we're going to get right started. For those of you who are not familiar with LMIC, here's just a quick list of our members. Uh, several of you can probably see our green states, which some of them are in the room, as well as some familiar associate members and USDA agencies. Big shout out to USDA, where we use 90% of our data to use um, to put out market projections. So our outlook for 2022, I'm not gonna get into the real specifics unless anyone has a real question, but these arrows give you a pretty general idea of what we're expecting for cattle and hogs. So production down for cattle, prices up. That's largely what we have in 2023 as well. We are expecting a small pullback in beef exports in 2022 from the record high levels we're expecting in 2021. On the hog side, we're not quite as optimistic. Uh, we have commercial production and slaughter up about less than 1%, a little bit of a pullback in prices after the great prices we saw in 2021, and a little bit smaller exports as well. Now, I organize my talk into three categories of drivers, short-term, medium-term, long-term. So short-term is what we're looking at for the next three to six months, and several of our speakers have already kind of talked about feed costs, drought, some of the normal types of things that we would expect in an outlook presentation. On the feed cost side, we are expecting feed costs to remain rather high, even in 2022-23, feed costs are still expected to be higher than probably the long-term average. On the cattle side, a big driver is gonna be the trajectory of the cattle cycle. We're expecting inventory numbers to be coming down. We we're about a 2% decline in 2021 and about 1% in 2022, and that's really gonna, what's gonna help support prices for the next two to three years. Beef demand this year has been absolutely phenomenal, both on the domestic front and the international front. Um, where that goes in 2022 and 2023, as I mentioned, we have a little bit of pullback on the international side, which is kind of a normal expectation once you have a really high level, but we're still expecting over about 3 billion pounds every year uh, in 2022 and 2023. Like, as I mentioned, we're not as optimistic on the hog side. Uh, the profit margin we're expecting to be a little bit worse Pork demand pulled back a little bit this year from the record large uh, international exports we saw in 2020, in 2020. And we've seen a little bit of weakness in wholesale pork prices this year domestically, whether that continues or not. Now, I, do put, I did put disease pressure on here, and we've heard a lot about ASF, but that's not what I'm referring to in this slide. We had a big problem with PERS this winter, right? We're wondering what's going to happen this next year and how that affects sow productivity, pigs per litter, and our ability to really ramp up production if we do have really strong demand. Now, over the last several years, since 2019, market volatility has been absolutely crazy, and that's because of the black swan events. The whole fire in 2019, COVID in 2020, 2021, we had the Grand Isle fire, we're still dealing with COVID, and so that has made it very fun to be a market analyst and try and predict prices. Right. Um, the other short-term driver that I think I need to mention here is livestock mandatory price reporting. 
that expires at the end of September. That's, how, that's the mechanism at which we get wholesale meat prices, a lot of fed slaughter prices for hogs and cattle. That requires political action to continue, right? Either through extension or reauthorization. So that could cause some disruptions as well if something happened there. In the medium uh, and the medium term, so like let's call that the one to three year outlook, we're really focused on the economy. For anyone who hasn't checked the stock market today, do yourself a favor and don't, right? So what does the economic picture look like from here on out? Are we optimistic? We've had a lot of government stimulus, supportive monetary policy over the last year. And I think that's helped weather some of the consumer, de consumer demand slippage we might normally associate with such high, high retail prices. Now some of that's inflationary, but a lot of it on the meat side has been driven by challenges in the supply chain, extremely strong demand, really pushing up those retail values. Now I put this slide up every time I go to a producer audience lately, in part because, does anyone notice anything about chicken on this graph? Is it competitively priced compared to beef at the retail level? So normally when we run into an economic condition where prices are having, consumers are having to make financial decisions on the meat case, you see beef demand suffer a little bit. And I, I jokingly have also said lamb's not on this graph, but that's basically the only thing making beef look less expensive. So long-term drivers, what happens after the three-year mark? Now I borrowed this from my predecessor. This is things we've talked about for the last 10 years, but since I only had seven to 10 minutes, I had to pick a couple. So these are just the ones I decided to talk about today, and a lot of these are policy questions. So I come out this from, a, from an, economic, an economist point of view. That's not always the goal of some of these policy uh, questions, like market efficiency, economic drivers, but that's how I look at these. And labor is the big one, and we've heard that today already, right? That labor shortages, on-farm, harvesting, processing, restaurants, you, know, you name it, we've had labor problems. But at the harvest level, we've been having labor problems when labor was 3.5%. If you toured a slaughter plant three years ago, they were still talking about excessive turnover, difficulty picking up workers, and so that problem is still gonna be long-term. Now, technology is probably how we eventually alleviate that, but how long does it take to put those types of things in place? What sort of research capital timeline are you looking at to alleviate that problem? I think that's gonna be around to stay. Slaughter capacity has come up in our circles a lot. We've been talking about it a lot because of COVID and what does that affect on, or what has packer concentration had uh, to do with that? Now, absent of COVID, because the cattle's trajectory of the cycle is going down, I'm not sure you would have had a, a problem with slaughter capacity. Timing issue with COVID, et cetera, I don't think you necessarily would be having that conversation maybe in hogs in the fourth quarter, you run up against that sometimes. But one thing I'd like us to keep in mind is to get to packer concentration we see today took decades. And if you don't change the underlying economic drivers that forced us into packer concentration, adding more plants might not fix it either. In the long term, you might just end up not seeing those plants either be successful or not stay independent. And so that's one of the questions we have to deal with is Maybe it addresses some of the supply chain resilience, but do those plants really stay where we need them to be if the long-term economic factors push us back towards concentration? The other thing I would add here is smaller plants are gonna struggle with some of the same things that have forced us that way. Having only one species to rely on operating on fairly slim margins. Maybe not they're not slim today, but where do, what do they look like over the long term? So all of those factors are gonna come into effect. Market transparency legislation. Um, I'm always really concerned with unintended consequences here. The market, at least for the cattle side, has really driven us to pay people for better than average quality beef. That's what alternative marketing arrangements do. That's, what we're, that's what, where the market has really gone. And if you change sort of those consumer signals, does that mute what the consumer wants, depending on what sort of legislation practices you put in place. On the animal welfare standard, Prop 12 is probably the, the easiest one to reach out for. That's the one in California. Um, 
most of these animal welfare regulations, if you regulate it, will, will reduce production efficiency just by the nature of which, what they're asking producers to do. We've also seen age of slaughter limits introduced in several states. states. Um, so those are usually saying you can't slaughter an animal before X percent of its life is over. So it would be a pretty big change from how we do things today. Now, if we didn't regulate those factors, a lot of times the market would handle that through third-party certification, um, audits, that you could label that and yeah, capture that premium. If you regulate it, it's gonna change how the market values that. And we wanna be careful that those producers are getting paid for those efforts in the right way that gets compensated. Lastly, I wanna talk about climate regulation. We've heard a lot about that today. And um, Mr. Farger brought up sustainability and I was appreciative of his detail in that. The only thing I would say here is sustainability, how complete that view is, how consistent it is across companies, programs, what we decide to measure, what we decide not to measure, those all have impacts. Now we tend to focus on what we measure and so if you have singular types of measurements, that's gonna be where you succeed. But there's been lots of different aspects of sustainability and I was happy to see ec economic sustainability was on his slide. Um, but other things have, that have been considered include animal welfare, soil health, um, social, social, pro, social uh, factors as well. And so what we decide to do there is going to matter how that affects the industry later on. So with that, oh, sorry, one more. <laughs> so both of these last two things are really driven by consumer trends. What the consumer's expectation is, what they desire in the marketplace. And if I flipped back to the previous slide, some of those would also be driven by consumers. So the bottom line is the livestock industry is, as a forward consumer looking uh, field, is gonna have to contend with consume, what consumers want in the long term, no matter what. It's not always gonna be climate change. It's gonna be something else next. If you think about diets and how we view different nutrition trends, you can easily point to how evil saturated fat used to be. Then we followed that with Atkins. And then we, we've now come back to saturated fat's okay. It's trans fat that's bad. So how, how the consumer is reacting to livestock, beef, pork, et cetera, really plays a big role in what we're expecting out of our products and what sort of interest we have in carcass and non-carcass merits in the long term. I'll stop there. Thank you, Caitlin. So please have a seat. Uh, Dr. Meyer, please join us back. And if we can bring Jackson back in virtually, great. Um, so thank you all for asking lots of questions. They're filing in here rapidly and uh, on a wide range of subjects. So I'm just going to uh, shoot a few out here. And if more than one of you want to jump in on some of these, just uh, let me know with either a show of your finger or uh, and, and or jump in. Uh, Scott, we're going to start with you. Um, you showed that map of the proposed renewable diesel plants. Do you think they're all going to get built? No, I don't. Um, we, we've already seen some postponing. Uh, they're uh, scheduled to come online because they say the, the cost of the soybean oil is too high for them to be economical. So I think we're going to continue to see that. And if all of them were built uh, as well, it they would, they would flood the market in California for carbon credits. So I, I do not expect them all to be built. We, we will see some of them built. We are seeing that now, but I don't think we're going to get to 7 billion gallons in the next five or so years. Seth, anything you want to end on? Oh, I, I agree, and, and I, I think from, I was really glad to see Scott talk about that in detail and follow up and really make those points. And I guess when I'd say, looking at the map, while the size of those circles is important, I'd also say look at where those circles are at and who owns those circles. And it's a very different political dynamic than we see with fame production today. One of the uh, other questions that came in was about uh, just really input costs and the impact of you know where these fertilizer price trajectories are going to go. Uh, 
Seth, from your perspective, uh, folks are interested in what the overall impact on farm income is going to be as a result of all these higher input costs. I mean, can we still see it go up despite that? So I think that the, the challenge is, I, th I think the challenge will be moderating commodity prices and rising input prices. I really do think that as we look forward, that, that is somewhat of a natural correction that I worry about, that producers will get squeezed. So right now we're experiencing you know, very solid farm income and when we go forward, you know, those commodity prices ease a bit and at the same time, we have pretty strong growth in input prices to offset some of that. So I think that there is a real challenge of potential to get squeezed from both sides in the coming years. There's a, there's a potential. Jackson, you talked about interest rates being very favorable, and, and yes, so any of us who are borrowing money, especially for farmland, uh, are enjoying that right now. But, you know, we've got some big things going on, not only inflation, but, you know, we don't know if we're going to have a government shutdown. We don't know, you know, we hit the debt limit. We've got all these other factors out there. What is your advice to people that are going, looking ahead at the next one to five years on where interest rates are going to go? Well, it's the same story I've probably been saying for the last uh, two to three years, which is lock low and go long um, and, and trying to take advantage of these uh, long term low rates as for as long out as you can possibly do so responsibly given your capital stack. So uh, I look at uh, the 30 year, there's a lot of 30 year fixed rate products out there. So trying to get in, manage that interest rate risk and take advantage of this to try to lock in these rates for as long as you can. That's gonna be one of the offsets I think is, is uh, to some of the rising input costs will be lower interest expense potentially, uh, depending on that capital stack on the farm. Granted with the, the real estate, you know, that's it's a little bit more favorable probably to real estate owners, but you're also seeing it on uh, uh, livestock, farm machinery, uh, operating debt, those types of things as well. So being able to try to lock up that capital at, at that low cost and give that optionality back to the producer, I think it's going to be really important of, to manage that balance sheet risk. Caitlin, one for you that came in. Uh, Seth mentioned this too about increased beef and really protein consumption. You know, is it here to stay? Is it just because uh, people are saying, you know, we're cooking more at home, we want to have more high quality protein? What do you see on that? Sure. Turn my on. Yep. Okay. Um, well, if anybody thinks about the appliance shortage we got, we everyone went out and bought a new freezer, and so we had this interesting situation where people stocked up on meat. We got rid of a lot, we moved a lot of meat off the market in a very short period of time. Um, I think there was just less, less concern maybe about specific dietary needs, et cetera, when you're worried about where your food might come from and you're seeing those empty shelves. Now, moving forward, we are expecting consumption to come down a little bit, but some of that is going to be some price rationing on some of the higher cost proteins. You're also going to have some decrease in supply, which is going to population then is going to outpace that change in supply. And so from a calculation standpoint, um, you're going to see that disappearance get smaller, specifically on the beef side, um, but on the pork side as well. Chicken, we are not anticipating chicken to go down, um, and in fact, we have some fairly aggressive gains in pounds per person, um, you know, close to three pounds per person gain in 2022. Seth, anything you'd like to add on that or what you see for your longer term? Well, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm gonna throw it, can I ask a question here uh, one moment, which is what, hey, what do you think about the packer, relative packer, uh, eh, the balance between packer capacity on the beef side and animal numbers, and, and uh, will that improve cattle prices, I guess? So I think cattle prices are gonna improve more on the supply side, situation of just inventories coming down. Um, the pinch points in the supply chain have been really difficult to wrap your mind around in terms of how much of is it is it labor we had some problems with fabricating so you couldn't necessarily make all the cuts we also had the demand side that maybe you didn't have the restaurants that demanded those cuts anymore and so the packer margins are are still very large but i think there's still some fundamental differences there that aren't necessarily the same as they would be in a normal year yeah. all right no and, and and when it comes to to overall uh for, when it comes to meat consumption going forward. I guess I, I still don't know if we're all going to be going back to restaurants or not and how that'll all resolve itself. 
So I defer to other folks. I think that's a fantastic question, and, and all of you can think of your own consumption levels. How many times a week are you going out now versus what you were two years ago? Or does your favorite restaurant still exist? So one other question that came up, and I'd like to throw this to, to all of our panelists. Jackson, we can start with you. Um, Caitlin threw up a lot of different things that could be e emerging as threats uh, as we look forward both for crops and livestock. What do you see as the potential next big black swan event that we really should have on our radar and maybe we don't yet? Well, that, that's uh, always a, a tough thing to predict the black swan, right? But I, I do think that there's a lot of moving pieces, and you've heard a lot about them today, either uh, uh, electric vehicle and adoption there. Uh, I think cultured meat is probably one that uh, I'm keeping a close eye on, and how does that consumer think about uh, uh, sort of lab-grown or cell-cultured meat? Uh, and that's one that I think you know, there's a lot of investor activity at companies who are working in that space, and you're seeing more uh, countries looking at approving those types of uh, protein products. Uh, we saw it with plant proteins maybe you know 10 years ago really come into the space, and I think that's probably another uh, disruptor out there for the, the protein sector. Scott, how about you? Yeah, um, you know, by their nature, black zones are, like Jackson said, really unpredictable. But I think one thing that could easily throw a wrench in everything is uh, trade going forward. Um, you know, we, we saw what happened in 2018, 19 with soybeans with China. Uh, if we have that sort of event again, or if China has another ASF outbreak, that's gonna affect things quite a bit. Um, so, I mean, there's a, there's a whole list of things I'm watching from um, input prices, uh, Ida's, uh, Hurricane Ida's effects, um, and you know, bio, biofuel policy. But uh, I think one of the things that could impact prices probably the most, the most quickly would be a, a trade disruption for disease reasons or political reasons or other. Certainly both of those are all floating around. Caitlin, <laughs> mm -hmm. how about you? I would just like to vote no, no more black swans. <laughs> <laughs> but if I had to pick one, um, I guess the one I am worried about is ASF coming here, especially now that it's in, in the Dominican, but particularly if it enters the feral swine population. I know that's overly specific, so hopefully just nothing will happen. <laughs> but um, you know, the control aspect then becomes much more challenging and, and something that as Scott mentioned, would severely disrupt our trade and, and a lot of other things. Well, I liked your optimism or, or your denial. I don't know <laughs> that we shouldn't have any more. That's a good way of looking at it. Seth? Well, I, I guess I'd, I, I'd agree with Scott that I worry about some trade disruption. You worry about ASF. You worry about something which disrupts this really strong demand at the same time we've got rising input prices and supply chain disruptions that really starts to squeeze producers. So when I think from an agricultural risk standpoint, and, and those things aren't as un unimaginable as these black swan event that I can't yet imagine of what it is. Those things are actually much more tangible and that probably where my, my concern is. And then there's always the stuff we didn't anticipate. Right, like who would have anticipated everything we've seen with COVID, right? Um, not to that extent anyway. Um, last question for each of our panelists is, uh, and Scott, I'd like to start with you. Uh, Secretary Vilsack mentioned it, 2023 is gonna be here before we know it. I know that some growers are already starting to think about, well, what as a result of all these uh, supply chain disruptions and, uh, you know, disruptions in meat processing capacity and all these different factors that we've witnessed over the last two years, what, if anything, do we need to change in the next farm bill? And I know some folks might say, well, nothing, let's just let this one work and get th more things back to normal, whatever that is anymore. But are you starting to hear from your growers? Uh, and if so, what do you think is gonna surface as kind of like the next big thing in farm policy? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And we are starting to um, take early steps for farm bill internally and trying to get grower feedback at this point. Uh, one thing, that, that is on our um, list of items is, you know, we saw soybeans lo lose nearly a third of their demand during the trade war, um, but uh, PLC payments were never triggered for soybeans. Um, so really the, the basic farm safety net didn't really come into play uh, during that period. 
So that's something we're definitely looking at. Um, you know, is there is there a way to provide a safety net where if, uh, for soybeans where if another event like that happened again, um, there would be some help there on the farm bill side. But I mean, we're also looking at many other things such as sustainability uh, uh, as well and conservation programs. All right, and and as you look at some of those other risk management things, I mean, how do you are people talking about how do you have those permanent disaster? Crop insurance, which has been the bedrock of right. risk, risk management, how do those all work together? Exactly, and um, and those discussions are ongoing. You know, we uh, crop insurance is definitely a high priority for us. We we want to see that continue. We don't want to see anything take away from that. Um, but we are definitely the discussion out there about permanent disaster. Discussion about permanent disaster is definitely out there and part of the conversation right now. Okay. Galen, how about you? What do you see as the next big thing in farm policy? Well, I listed a whole bunch. <laughs> and, and so outside of those, I mean, I think those are the big ones that the industry will have to tackle eventually. And whether um, how those come about and what they look like is still very much being um, thought out and, and, and needs to be well thought out. Right. Seth? Yeah, so, so I think I, I first need to remind folks about USDA's role in the uh, production of the Farm Bill, right? <laughs> but I, I, I will, my take from my view, uh, seeing Secretary last time, he, you know, he's, this is his second stint at USDA, perhaps uh, a, a bit f distant from the Farm Bill process in terms of his first session, I don't get that same impression that that's how he, he wants to engage on the Farm Bill this next time around, wants to be informative and supportive and, and developmental. Um, and then I think the other big issue is, uh, along those lines, is issues related to climate in the Farm Bill and how they may intersect into the Farm Bill. And I think we see that in crop insurance as well, too, in terms of the kind of products that the last board meeting at FCIC uh, put out. So I think climate is the big issue that all that at least from USDA's perspective, it, it will try to highlight and, and inform. I've heard different people talk about there might be a climate title in the next farm bill, but then again, there's a conservation title and there's a lot of things that intersect. So yep. um, discussions there. Jackson, last word on this. Well, um, so I'll talk a little bit about the credit um, you know, environment. I think the, the you know, the business as usual is really good. I think the the, the t credit tiles have worked really well. Uh, but anything to support sort of a competitive market landscape, I think, is uh, um, a really you know imp important part of the the credit titles to the farm bill. Maybe uh, a little bit different perspective would be anything to support sort of the communities at large and economic opportunities. Uh, surrounding farms because uh, you know it's not just sometimes about the farm in the farm bill it's also about the community that they live in and have good access uh, to community facilities and things that you really need to have a good healthy vibrant community uh, out there so continuing to see strong support out there for these rural communities uh, and money for broadband and money for you know things that are going to keep economic acti activities and economic opportunities growing out there across rural America is something that I'm really excited to see. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time for this panel, but please join me in thanking Jackson and Scott, Caitlin and Seth. Excellent information, very helpful.